it is a very great pleasure. Um, thank you, David, for that great talk. And um, Andreas, it's great to have you here today as well. Um, this might sound funny, but I regard you as one of my children. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been very proud to be associated with you for so many years. We love working together. Andreas is um, an absolutely indefatigable scientist with um, great abilities, a great knowledge of the literature, and he has very greatly advanced the field. Andreas. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So I'm, I'm the bum who's currently sitting in that chair <laughs> that is so famous. OK, so um, I, I won't show you many data. I'll just um, uh, try to entertain you, but we'll show a few um, uh, data to you. So I, hopefully, you'll get some, some messages from my talk. Um, so yeah, 1989. Um, so 1989 was a big year. Um, the East Block fell down. And um, as Devo said, uh, BCL2 work and cell death work just exploded. So um, I, I came um, from Switzerland here as a, as a refugee. Um, one of the nicest things that Suzanne ever said to me is that I was the most un-Swiss person that she's ever met. And, uh, <laughs> Um, she can explain to you what she meant by that. Um, so yeah, this, these were new arrivals at the time, and these were the people who really mattered to me, and I really cannot thank enough Suzanne for taking me on as a postdoc, because um, I was a complete failure as a PhD student. I had nothing, and um, I still don't understand why Suzanne took me on. She must have been very desperate for personnel. I, I, have, I have never hired anybody with my um, publication record. <laughs> and I never will, <laughs> in case you want to apply here. So. Um, and um, yes, so what Deva didn't say is that in the, from 86 to about 93, at any time, there was only one student or one postdoc at WeHi working on program cell death. At that time, several labs in the US were competing against us with about 20 or 30 postdocs and students. Um, yet we managed to publish exactly the same amount of papers as Dai did. And um, you can try and figure out what that, uh, that meant. Um, actually, Dan and I were reminiscing at the cancer conference. We both said that our wife said the same thing, and that was basically, um, I can count how many times you were at home by the number of children that I had. <laughs> um, okay, so um, jokes aside, so, um, so I came with a little bit of knowledge in immunology and a huge amount of energy because I, I was uh, doping with EPO by uh, spending our honeymoon with my wife in, uh, in Nepal, which was uh, fantastic, and I benefited from a huge amount of help from Subaf and um, also they were inducting me into the work that I was um, was about to do. And yeah, I um, actually managed today not to fall um, into tears talking about Alan Harris, who was a great friend. Okay, so they were ended up on the transgenic mice. So I was so lucky to inherit these, these mice. And what could we show? Well, firstly, something we expected and that is that this was the final proof that BCL2, when it's overexpressed, causes uh, cancer, especially together with MYC, as you've heard. Um, that was the final end um, of that story. But then there was huge surprises. Nobody expected that these mice would get autoimmune disease. This just shows um, the kidney destruction in these mice and the deposits of autoantibodies in, that, uh, in these mice. Um, so I was trained as an immunologist, that's why I was lucky enough to, to recognize this. And I always went to the immunology talks at WeHi, and um, um, the most senior immunologists, most of them thought I was completely crazy. They said a cancer gene cannot cause autoimmune disease. But I was really lucky because um, Suzanne was supportive, uh, Jerry was very skeptical, but supportive. Um, Alan was enthusiastic, as he always was. Uh, but I was very lucky. Um, Jacques Miller, um, my hero here, um, he fell in love with the idea. And he said, this explains negative selection, explains everything. And then later on, Philippe Bouillet um, actually proved that. 
And then even more importantly, practically, was uh, this lady here saying, I'm waiting him, that I'm really sad that she's not here today. Um, she said, I can actually help you prove that these mice get autoimmune disease. She did. And Jacques actually helped us publish the paper. Then a couple of years later, Nagata um, rediscovered what we discovered, uh, but did give us a break. So here's some, uh, uh, some lessons for you students. So um, um, yeah, the most important thing with um, work is you have to be lucky, and then you have to recognize when you're lucky. I was very unlucky during my PhD, but I was certainly very, very lucky um, coming here. And then, yeah, learn from your colleagues and engage with them and get help from the best. Uh, what else did we do with these mice? So um, this was an interesting experiment that Alan um, and Suzanne and I planned, and that was to um, not only look at growth factor withdrawal effects on cell survival, but actually throw some anti-cancer therapies at these cells. And um, I remember at that time, I was very brash, and I would use very bad language, which I never do anymore. And, uh, <laughs> So I was reading out this assay in front of Suzanne's office on a really old rickety microscope. And um, I saw all these cells that don't express BCO2 survive anti-cancer therapies. And I thought, this is amazing. This is the first demonstration that anti-cancer drugs kill by apoptosis. And it also, of course, indicates that if we could make drugs against this proteins that keep cells alive, those could become anti-cancer drugs. Anyhow, I was sitting there looking at the cells, counting them, and um, using some very interesting words. And um, Suzanne knew what experiment I was reading out, and she came running out of the office and said, oh dear, the experiment failed. And Alan Harris, who was quite far away but could still hear me, God knows why, he came and said, Suzanne, you don't understand this boy. Um, the experiment must have worked spectacularly. <laughs> and as you can see, it, it did. The next discovery um, we made was that there's actually two apoptotic cell death uh, pathways, which are shown here. And the details are not that important, but the synergy of that, which synergy basically means one plus one can be 100, is shown here. So you have, uh, this is the lymph nodes you find in a normal mouse. This is the size of the lymph nodes in a mouse when the pathway that Devo mentioned about doesn't work, so they'll be bigger. Um, you have this other pathway, which is called the pathway, the lymph nodes are a bit bigger. You put the two defects into the one animal and it just explodes. It's just quite unbelievable. It's a good example of what synergy actually looks like. Okay, what came next? So Suzanne indicated already, um, then came the time when other members of the BCL2 family were um, discovered, mostly those that actually kill cells. And the ones we were mostly involved with was the so-called bh 3 only proteins, which is actually on which the drugs are mimicked. So these are some of the people that played a huge role in um, my lab and Suzanne's lab on that. And you will hear from David Wang on that, who co-discovered the uh, BIM with uh, Liam O'Connor, was a student in my lab. So this, this picture is actually great. This is a wonderful place in Switzerland, high up in the mountains. And guess what this place is called? It's called BIM. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable, but true story. And so the mice here. So we love working uh, with mice. And this is a beautiful series of allelic mice that Philippe Bouillet, who we can see here, made, which actually demonstrate that these death-inducing proteins and the survival-inducing proteins interact with each other uh, functionally. So um, if you take away... Um, the pro-death molecule BIM, then the mice become, uh, the pro-survival protein BCL2, the mice become gray. You take away um, one allele of BIM, they're still gray. You take away both, and they don't, they're not gray. So we were dreaming about making billions of dollars in, um, in, in the um, uh, beauty industry. And uh, Jerry and I did personal experiments on it. And as you can see, they dismally uh, failed. <laughs> um, there's still hope. Maybe somebody's got a better idea of how to target BIM, and then we won't go gray anymore. And uh, this is Andy Bilongo. So these are other people who then came into play to work on the BH3 only proteins. Uh, very happy faces. And the football was always a big thing in our lab, it still is. Uh, this uh, is Hamza Vitalika, who ran the early soccer team. And then I'd also like to point out um, Lee Kultis, who 
is an example of somebody who can be incredibly unlucky in a PhD and then very successful afterwards. So he was the first, one of the first people in my lab to make knockout mice, and um, he was uh, unfortunate enough to knock out uh, three genes that when you knock them out, there's no phenotype. Um, great PhD, um, certainly somewhat um, uh, unhappy to, to end up with, but then he went to Toronto and had a Nature article within about seven months or so. So he certainly got what he deserved after me. So actually, when his thesis got reviewed, one of the reviewers, go figure that, one of the reviewers said, um, why did you choose to knock out genes that when you knock them out, you get no phenotype? Wow. <laughs> I felt like writing back to this guy and it's because I'm a cruel bastard. <laughs> um, Probably I am. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, so finally, um, the second last slide, so then really it became really interesting when it came clear from the work of the people whose faces I showed um, that these BH3 only proteins are actually essential for killing cells, uh, cancer cells, in response to a diversity of anti cancer drugs that are used, even the novel inhibitors of oncogenic kinases like Gleevec, which is what Junya Kuroda, the, the Japanese guy on the picture before. So that then really set the scene for saying, OK, if we can make drugs that inhibit um, or mimic what the BH3 only proteins do, that could be something. So the so-called um, BH3 um, mimetic drugs. And the start of that was because um, we had friends at Genentech at that time already. Um, we had even sent students to these places, to these people. So that started it. So I really would like to end up again on, um, well, thanking not only Suzanne for taking me on as a bum on a chair, but um, supporting me. And this has been a phenomenal trek. Um, tough, but uh, made a lot of fun, um, although I should have said never politically correct. Um, uh, by the great company I've had in my lab. And um, so um, thanks a lot for listening. And I'd love to hand over to David, who then really did phenomenal stuff. Thank you.